Rich Folly, and you are watching PBS Books live coverage of the National Book Festival hosted by the Library of Congress. It's an amazing Saturday here in Washington, D.C. at the Convention Center, and we're kicking off our coverage today with Jericho Brown, amazing poet, person who just came off stage here. First of all, what an amazing thing to have you. How was your event upstairs? Oh, we had a great time. I was with the Poetry Out Loud winners, and so one of them is 17 years old and the other is 18 years old and they recited poems to this very large audience here at the National Book Festival. And so they have this bravery and this confidence that I want to have in my own life. So it was quite inspiring for me. I had a great time. That's funny that you say that because I've seen you read and you're an amazing oh, reader and an amazing poet. And I, I know that like so much of poetry is that out loud component. Were you always, you talk about how you were just born to be a poet. Did you always have that ability to kind of just step out and, and, and be confident and bold like that? Yes and no. It really wasn't a choice, to be quite honest with you. I grew up in the black church, and in the black church where I grew up, uh, everybody always had to, whether they liked it or not, uh, show their faith in public. So if it was Easter, you had an Easter speech. I mean, it was required if you were two or three years old and you had language, you would at least have to say, Jesus wept on a Sunday morning. And there was always a different kind of a program, an Easter pet, an Easter uh, play, an Easter program, a Christmas play, a Christmas pageant, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Throughout the year, there was always a reason to trot out very, very young kids and have them do something in public. So I, it was a part of my life that I didn't really feel like I had choice um, in. So I never got to know whether or not I was comfortable doing it. I just had to do it. Yeah, the intonation. There's so much drama in the church and yeah, the intonation and the ability yeah. to deliver a powerful message, knowing when to come up and when to come down. Mm -hmm. You must have just, you know, soaked so much of that up at the time. I think listening to the songs uh, when I was a kid growing up, hearing the music in church and hearing the preacher, the Reverend Harry Blake, who was the preacher when I was, um, when I was a kid at the Mount Cana Missionary Baptist Church, uh, hearing his intonations, hearing how he would move into something and change the level of his voice until he all had us enraptured at the end. A lot of that has a lot to do with how I think about poems, their rises and falls, their climaxes, um, and how I make a poem happen when I'm writing and I'm revising. Yeah, your, your newest collection, The Tradition, is beautiful. Yeah. And there's so much uh, personal, like, gut-wrenching stuff in here. And I think one of the things that I've seen you talk about and I, and I felt when I was reading your poems is the sort of mix, the way you blend the harsh realities, the, uh, the, the brutality sometimes of life with a loving life, you know, of like kind of understanding that people are trying as hard as they can yeah. and working hard to sort of be loving. That yeah. sort of blend, the juxtaposition of those two yeah. things comes across in almost every poem. Yeah, it's not an easy world we're living in right now. I was thinking about this actually just now with the young people. Um, they sort of got a lukewarm applause at first and I said, uh, you know, I want y'all to imagine being 17 and I want you to imagine everything that you needed when you were 17. This is what I said to the audience. And then I said, I want you to imagine it in 2019. It's a very different time to be a young person. And it's a very different time for all of us. We're um, entering a world that seems to have changed in so many ways in such a short period of time. And what's fascinating to me about that world is no matter how hard it is, people still fall in love. I'm amazed by yeah, that. It is. People still feel joy. Yeah. People still find a way and a reason and the wherewithal to make it another day, uh, no matter how difficult things can be. And that's what I'm interested in in this book. I'm interested in the fact that we are, whether we like it or not, survivors. We find a way. And when we're not finding a way for ourselves, we find a way for somebody else. And so often somebody's finding a way for us. And I think that's what the tradition is about. Um, that's what's really being passed down. Yeah. What's being passed down is being passed down in spite of. And I love that about about yeah, you know, us, there's, about there's human a, beings. When I was reading, when I, when I read your poems, um, there, there's a rawness to them. There's an anger sometimes, and yet there's a restraint. And I don't know, in a time where there is a lot of rage, as you're working through these poems and maybe feel that rage, you write about police brutality and, and family difficulties and challenges between you know, uh, friends and family, uh, there's a desire sometimes just be angry, but like your poems have, uh, 
a thoughtful level to them. Mm -hmm. how, how do you kind of take it down that notch from seeing some of the things that can drive people crazy, that can br bring rage in, and to find a way to talk about them in a way that has a leveled, conversational, hard-hitting you know, style? I have, I have to say, to be quite honest with you, um, if anything, I mean to in incite rage <laughs> yeah. because I do feel rage, and yet, I mean to incite that rage at the level that we have to endure it every day. You know, we really, I mean, we haven't yet had a, a public conversation about it, but our entire country suffered a trauma the day we watched Mike's, Mike Brown's body lie in the street for hours, the day that it took forever to get somebody to, to cover him up. And my memory is that somebody had to sneak through the barricade to cover his body up while his mother watched his body lie dead on the street for hours. And the next day, you know what everybody had to do? They had to go to work. They had to feed their kids um, in spite of that trauma. And so if the poems have any restraint, the restraint has to do with the fact that the next day you still have to go on. The next day, the expectations of this nation often, the expectations of the capitalist system in which we live is often that we you know, we take it on the chin, as my dad used to say, right? Uh, and so part of what the poems is actually, the poems are actually asking through their restraint is whether or not that's okay. Should we instead be screaming in the streets or at least punching a pillow? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where is the outlet for all that rage that we are indeed feeling right now? Um, if we are experiencing some community trauma, some national trauma um, has gotten to a point you know this, it's gotten to the point that mass shootings in schools and theaters, wherever they happen, they're so prevalent, they can't even make the top of the news anymore. Yeah. You know, you, you, <laughs> so you, that's what I mean when I'm making restraint happen in a poem. I'm trying to imitate that fact, right? That these things have become normal to us. And I'm sort of asking through the restraint, the irony of the restraint, whether or not they should be normal. I don't think they should be. I think that, to me, that's one of the themes of Ganymede, which yeah. is a poem uh, that's the first poem in the book. But uh, as I read it, I'm going to have you read it first, and there's a couple lines in there that are particularly potent to me. Um, but I, I wouldn't mind if you could read it to us, and if, if you'd like, you can read it right to camera, which is right in front of you. Yeah, I'll read it. Ganymede. A man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like the safety of it. No one at fault, everyone rewarded. God gets the boy, the boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying, rape. I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. That seems to me to be that that warning that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. And, and that, that note, that, that line between promise and apology. Yeah. Can you describe that a little bit? That just stuck with me. Yeah, it's, well, you know, there's a, um, <clears throat> that line, those, that line between promise and apology is sort of um, that line of the American dream, right? Over and over again, there's this expectation. Um, I think there's this real huge belief in this country about hard work and hard work benefiting us in the long run um, and then when it doesn't benefit us what do we get um, and sometimes I think that sometimes sometimes I think we're we're in a situation where um, we suspect we're, we're suspecting 
we have questions, we're suspicious of the promise. Um, maybe the apology is not getting delivered. Um, we haven't gotten any apologies for a long time, so we're wondering how true the promise is. Um, that seems to be the, 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 the condition of the 21st but century. But a willingness to accept it sometimes when in fact maybe there needs to be a louder scream. To yeah, your yeah, point, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it seems. yeah, yeah. You know, that finding the vulnerability to write your poems and to, and to be truthful and raw and honest with yourself and with your own situation and with the world around you, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I know, I, I'm curious because your name, you weren't born with the name Jericho Brown, but I'm curious as you started to dig and find who you wanted to be and how you wanted to write poetry and how you wanted to talk about the world, did that name change have something to do with that? And, and how do you find the path to being as, as open and raw as you need to be in your poems? You know, I think it did have something to do with it, although I didn't, I didn't think about it when I was changing my name. I changed my name because my, my birth name is Nelson Demery III. And when my, my poems first started um, being published in magazines, I would see Nelson Demery III and I would feel as if I still was at a loss for something that was supposed to be my success because I was sharing this name right, and I wanted third. my poems to be mine, right. you know. I was like, these are my poems, why is somebody else's name on them? And so the name change had to do with that. Um, but it is true that changing my name put me in a position where I felt more free to become who I wanted to be. There was this identity that I could build around Jericho Brown that maybe didn't exist for Nelson Demery III, right? Uh, so I do think that that has something to do with it. But quite honestly, I find that if I am not vulnerable to my work, if I don't allow it to do what it needs to do, which is to tell the truth, um, if that doesn't happen when I'm writing, then I'm not making good poems. Any way you look at it, I got to make good poems. I can't I can't be out here making bad poems, man. Yeah. This is literally my life and my livelihood. Um, this is where I get the feeling that I get to want to get up in the morning, you know, so. Uh, yeah, there was something you said, and because you, you're, you're HIV positive and you were sick at one point and you wrote something about the duplex, this, this poem form that you created that was unique and it was, in your subconscious, you said, while you're doing dishes and things, trying to figure out yeah. like this, this form. Yeah. But you said that when you were sick and getting better, uh, that you were, you were finding proof uh, that you were, are a poet, yeah. and that you, that you were doing many of the things that you had been planning to do in, through, and with poems. That yeah. the sort of natural draw yeah. to that form to work through issues in your own life. Yeah. That to me was really powerful. The, yeah. It's a draw that you can't resist. Yeah, well, you know, I was sick. I actually really just had the flu. But, you know, when you have a really bad flu, you right. feel close to death. Right. And I remember feeling like, oh, there's only so much life. Like, for a second, I had this glimpse where, oh, there's only so much time I have. And there are many things that I want to do with poems. There are many things I want to say in poems. There are many things I want to try with my poems. Um, and, I, and that's another reason why I don't have time to be anything other than intimate and vulnerable when I'm writing my work. I want... What I want when I read, when I read poems, I want poems that come to me straight to my heart. So those are the poems that I'm trying to write. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when I made the duplex, for instance, coming up with a form that turns out to be a very difficult form, yeah. <laughs> it turns out that people email me all the time like, how do you do this? this? How do you do <laughs> yeah. this, right? Um, but there have been some people to write some great duplexes. There are duplexes coming out in magazines now that I, ha that I didn't yeah. write. So that's wow. beautiful to see. Um, but I really wanted to merge these past forms, parts of the tradition, the hustle, the sonnet, the yeah. blues, the subvert, put them the together. Sonnet, the idea of turning it on its head. Yeah, to change our idea of what the sonnet is and our identification as a sonnet. You know, um, I'm a person with many identities, many subjectivities, and people like to believe that they're at war with one another but I don't feel like they're at war with one another. And I definitely don't feel like I'm percentaged out. I don't feel 27% black and 16% Southern and 49% uh, queer. Like I don't feel that way. I feel like everything I am, I am whole. And the duplex for me is a way of showing all of these forms that are a part of my tradition as a poet and they're all their whole. Yeah, so. but you have talked about this idea of like being a mutt. 
yeah. you know, like this idea of black, yeah. southern, queer, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that that combination of things, which is you, it is yeah. you, 100% you, but that it's still this kind of amalgamation of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah which is a wild concept to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's another poem. But it's the American, that is the American concept, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Right? Isn't that interesting, right? And then some of us can be more aware of that in ourselves than others, yeah, right? Why do you the, think the, the some difference. people aren't aware of it? Why do you think some people, like, push they that off? They don't have to be, right? Um, you know, <laughs> many of us are in a position where we ever have to recognize how much our, what we think of as our own culture is an amalgamation of several cultures, in, in particular in this country, how all culture seems to appropriate or at least be rooted in black culture, right? right? Um, and if we were to really look at the root of things, we would see that. Um, but that's something folk don't have a reason to see, and it's something people don't want to see. I think maybe for some really sad, obvious reasons. Yeah, I think on the other side, there's people, there's, we're in a confusing time for that appropriation of black culture where people want to be a part of there's there's these young group, you know crowds and other people with music and yeah. and 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 movies and writers like yourself yeah. and poets they they want to be around it and touch it and feel it yeah. and sometimes awkwardly you know yeah. like not sure like how to do it but yeah. it's just they're going to gra they're grabbing it yeah. so yeah there's another line uh, from a poem and we'll close on this it's called as a human being and the last line um, which which means a lot to me and uh, because it was free now that nobody's got to love you. And, it, and, and it'll make more sense after you read the poem, but it really was about this idea of um, when the people around you are, aren't here anymore and some of the uh, conflicts that were there when they were with you or around you, alive, whatever, uh, go, it opens up this world, uh, as sad as it may be, that is different, uh, where all of a sudden some of the bonds and things that tied you down aren't there anymore. Um, even though they're always there in some way, shape, or form, but it felt really powerful to me, and it felt like a lot about who you've become and how you've kind of become this thing, this, this free poet that uh, understands who you are and knows how to communicate it. And I thought maybe you could finish with a reading of that poem for us. Sure. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital where she will settle next to him forever as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing and it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won, marred him. He'll have a scar he can see, all because of you and your mother. The only woman you ever cried for must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury. No matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free, now that nobody's got to love you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Jericho Brown, so cool to meet you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining Thank PBS so Books much. today. Thanks for having me. And for being a big part of this event here. <laughs> the book is The Tradition by Jericho Brown, new collection of poems, re recent collection of poems, really wonderful. Thanks, everybody. There's lots more to come here at the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Rich Folly, and you're watching PBS Books. <laughs>